Washington's skills were put to the test in the first week of 1791. The issue at hand was whether or not to charter a national bank, winchpin of the Hamiltonian system. Jefferson and Attorney General Edmund Randolph opposed the idea, basing their stance on a narrow reading of Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which authorizes Congress to, quote, make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Few imagined it at the time, but the future course of American Union pivoted on those Delphic adjectives, necessary and proper. For Jefferson, convenience should not be confused with necessity. There was nothing in the Constitution that authorized a federal bank, said the Secretary of State. He buttressed his claim by citing the unratified Tenth Amendment, which reserved to the states all powers not clearly enumerated in the Constitution. For Jefferson, this was an acid test, that the, this was a confederation. It was not a nation in the way that you and I understand it. This was um, an improvement on the League of States, but it was still very much a, a, a government where states had rights. Shaken by the force of such arguments, Washington invited Hamilton to refute his detractors. Using ridicule, where logic did not suffice, Hamilton exposed the inconsistencies of strict constructionism. A government empowered to build lighthouses to promote commerce could hardly balk at chattering a bank to collect its taxes, pay its salaries, or service its debt. Hamilton's plea for the bank did not convert the president so much as it reinforced his nationalistic outlook. He signed the bank bill, and the rest is history. Striving to remain above the partisan fray, Washington was careful to label the new regime national rather than federalist. He did not want anyone to believe that he had been, in effect, taken over by one political party or another. Many historians have described him as a bit player in his own administration. Uh, someone shunted to the wings by more dynamic actors like Hamilton and Jefferson, an Eisenhower-like chairman of the board uneasily presiding over an opinionated squad of advisors whose intellectual firepower matched their talent for recrimination. I think it's more accurate to say that he was sufficiently sure of himself to allow Hamilton and Jefferson this street brawl. Remember, what did Washington want to do? Washington wanted to buy time. Washington wanted to avoid the onset of intense partisan political struggle as long as he could. Um, basically, his great success was to keep Hamilton and Jefferson inside the tent, I won't quote J. Edgar Hoover, um, at a time when uh, both of them wanted to be outside the tent. The political general had not lost his touch. If his first term was dominated by Hamilton's economic program at home, his second term was defined by war overseas and the domestic stresses it provided. Ultimately, I would argue Washington proved more visionary than either of his warring subordinates. Stay out of Europe's murderous quarrels, he reasoned, and given 20 or 30 years of peaceful development, the United States would be in a position to defy any power on earth. So when England and France went to war, Washington took it upon himself to issue a neutrality proclamation an extraordinary exercise of power, and another step that defined the presidency in ways that the, the men who wrote the Constitution probably uh, could never have imagined. Only Washington had the prestige, by the way, to make it stick. He sent John Jay, the Chief Justice, to, to England to defuse a war scare, and he shouldered the blame. He personally took the blame and the political heat when Jay brought back an unpopular treaty that enraged Jefferson's followers. The House of Representatives demanded he turn over all papers arising out of Jay's mission, and Washington refused. And in doing so, he invented what we call executive privilege, a doctrine that would come to be abused occasionally, but which started uh, as a bulwark against an otherwise imperial Congress. There was something called the Whiskey Rebellion, which sounds kind of vaguely comical in western Pennsylvania. Um, remember, there was no coinage, there's no currency as you and I, no money. Whiskey often served that purpose. It served many purposes in western Pennsylvania, but it was, uh, it was actually a kind of a currency. And they didn't want to pay a tax on it, and Hamilton wanted it taxed, 
to support his system. Well, it was unpopular, and there was actually a mini rebellion brewing in western Pennsylvania, and this was a real test of the government. Washington, the only president in American history thus far who put on a military uniform as president, got on horseback and led an army of 16,000 men, about 10 times as many as you needed to crush this revolt. But he was demonstrating the force and the prestige and, yes, the power of the central government. Um, he put his own prestige behind a principle critical to any republic, namely that dissatisfied minorities can protest peacefully, but they cannot take arms against even the most unpopular official acts. Finally, in his famous and often misunderstood farewell address, Washington left behind a roadmap to genuine national independence and a timeless warning about the excesses of political parties. The strong leader of a weak nation, Washington threw all his prestige on the scales of constitutional government. Still, no constitution by itself could begin the world over or make human beings into angels. Washington of all men understood the limits of virtue. The best he could realistically hope for was to create political institutions that would inhibit the baser side of men while channeling their energies into subduing the continent and fulfilling the promise of Republican government. It was against this backdrop in his farewell address that he warned his fellow countrymen against what he called the small but artful and enterprising minority whose primary allegiance was to a party. In their place, the president demanded, quote, a government of as much vigor as is consistent with the perfect security of liberty. He had the balance 200 years ago. Absolutely right. It's a balance that 200 years later we're still debating. But he defined it. His private life, though not without its trials, provided a satisfying counterpoint to the splendid misery of partisan combat. When the Philadelphia Aurora, an opposition newspaper, revealed that he had overdrawn his salary to pay the heavy cost of official entertaining, Washington suffered the tortures of the damned but he never complained in public. Privately, he railed against newspaper editors who were, he said, stuffing their papers with scurrility and nonsensical declamation. A complaint, no doubt, made in somewhat more pungent language by every president since. I will never forget, when you ever, anyone who wants to write about Washington, they, they're faced with the challenge of making this marble man human. And I despaired of it at the beginning when I was working on my book. And then I realized, first of all, what, Washington is most human when he's most vulnerable. And that's the last 10 years of his life. He's an old man. I've already described some of his weaknesses. He's a vulnerable figure. And his greatest sacrifice was to give up peace of mind, to give up life at Mount Vernon on this untested new experiment. But it was even more personal than that. I'll never forget one day at Mount Vernon, I found in the, in the archives a letter written near the end of her life by his adopted granddaughter, uh, Patsy uh, Custis, known as Nellie in the family. Washington, of course, had no children of his own. He was very sensitive about that fact. He liked children very much. Martha had children. They died, but he then, in effect, adopted her grandchildren. Nellie was one of them. Anyway, Nellie recalled before she died a story that I think tells you volumes about Washington and the price that he paid. Um, his office was in the same building as his residence in Philadelphia. And at the end of a long day of paperwork and meetings, he would leave his office, walk down the hall, and open the door into the room where Nellie and her playmates were. And like many old men, he, uh, he drew a kind of sustenance from seeing young people at play. The problem was, the minute the children looked up and they saw standing there the figure known as Great Washington, they froze. Um, and it all came back to me. This was a man who, for the last 25 years of his life, found it impossible to be totally natural, even around his own grand granddaughter and her playmates. Uh, he had been embalmed while he was still alive. He had been turned into a marble statue. It's like Midas's touch in reverse. 